the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is something that you are part of through the course of the year. Uh, we give a gift each year out of our one fund uh, offering. And so if you give to Westside at any point during the year, you are helping to fund the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which goes directly to the missionary effort across the world. Uh, good morning, church family, and uh, glad to be here with you today. Pastor David is not in today, uh, but he will have a special video announcement at the end of the service. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you are one of those in the habit of when the invitation hits, that's your cue to book it. Uh, maybe hang around with us a little bit longer today. Uh, so here's, I'm going to attempt a guarantee that I'll move quickly through the message so that there's plenty of time at the end of the service because not only do we have a video from Pastor David with an announcement, but at the end of our service today, we will have a, uh, our annual budget vote for the upcoming uh, new year. And so you'll want to be part of that, uh, those of you who are members. And so uh, just stay put toward the end of the service and we'll get all of that taken care of. Everybody doing all right? Everybody feeling okay? Everybody happy? You'd be surprised how often I go places and ask that and people say, no, uh, that's the current state of affairs, isn't it? You, I want to ask this question as we start out this morning and uh, just, just go with me quickly. Just go with me quickly. I want to have a brief sermon, but one that hopefully will stick with you for a long time. We're beginning the Advent season as, as we move toward Christmas. We're going to begin preparing the way by looking at the life of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a man with a very particular call. He fills a very particular role. He's the last prophet of the Old Testament. And his message is prepare the way. And I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 3 because we're going to look at the beginning stages of his ministry and while you're turning there, I want to read to you from Luke chapter 1, before John is ever born, the angel delivers what will become his call and his emphasis of his ministry. And in Luke chapter 1, this is what the angel himself says. The angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Now here it is. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is the call. This is the mandate that is on the life of John. And by the end of our time together this morning, I hope that you will be able to discern what is God's call and mandate for you. And in that spirit, I'd like to invite you, this might be a little bit unusual, but just go with it for a second. Would you bow your head with me? But in this moment, I don't want us necessarily to pray. I just want to give you a moment of silence, maybe 30 seconds. I'll watch the time, don't worry. And in the moment of silence, I want you to ask yourself this question. How is your soul? We go to doctors to check up on how our body is. We go to advisors to check up on how our finances are. When was the last time you had an encounter with God and asked, how is my soul? Would you just take a moment in silence and ask yourself that question? Somebody said, reflecting on the world that's around us, everything is different from what it's supposed to be here. 
Are you feeling the, the weight of that yet as you look around the world? And the reality is it takes a wall that is on plumb to expose, to reveal, to show, to prove the one that is off plumb. And in a world where everything is different from what it's supposed to be here, perhaps it's getting harder and harder to be a believer who is a wall on plumb in the society that surrounds us. Would you say that that's mostly true? Yes or no? Oh, by the way, um, we'll go a whole lot faster if you preach back at me. <laughs> we will. If I know you're there, if I know you're with me, we'll keep moving fast. It's harder and harder because we are all, each of us, no matter how separate we try to be, we are all marinating in a culture that seems to be going faster and faster into decay. And we are trying to figure out ways that we as believers in Christ can reflect who he is. And this is the opportunity. This is not a, a, a condemning message. This is not a, a, a reproach message or a discipline message. This is an invitation. This is an opportunity. This is not a we have to message. This is a we get to message. And the message is this, that we can build a bridge to the world and invite that world which needs hope, needs life, needs forgiveness, needs salvation, needs repentance. We can invite them to a savior who is Jesus Christ, but the only way that we're gonna build a bridge to the world is by building that bridge out of gospel believers who look different, think different, act different, talk different, are different from the world they're trying to reach. This is the life of John the Baptist. This is who he is. He looks very different from the world around him. He acts very differently. He, you just heard the mandate on his life of how he was going to be separate from those people who were around him. He dresses in funny clothes. He eats a weird diet. He has a weird message. He calls people out. He is singular in his time, and yet he is the bridge that prepares the way. And we already know that the best bridges are different from the things that they span and the masses they connect. If you went to a bridge and it was made out of the dirt that it connects on either side of a span, you probably wouldn't get on it. At least I wouldn't. If you went and the bridge was made out of the water that it crosses, well, that would be worth taking a picture of, but I don't think I'd get on it. Bridges are different. They're made of something, some material that's different from that which they connect and that which they span, and that is the call for you and I. So let's look at Matthew chapter 3, and, and very quickly, very quickly, I want to observe three things about the calling of John that calls us to be different. So Matthew chapter 3, in those days... Verse one, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you take notes in your Bible or, or you write stuff down, just write that word, repent. Repent, just make note of it. If you don't write in your Bible, that's fine. Just highlight it in your mind. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Some of you are like, nope, this is not me. This is not the different I'm gonna be. I was with you till then. Confessing their sins, uh, well, I skipped a verse here. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And then we have this interesting moment. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Make note of that word, repentance. Do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that 
these stones God can raise up for children of Abraham. Here's the first principle of John's call. John's call calls us to be faithful voices. Isaiah says about him, he is to be a voice of one calling in the desert. You know, there's a necessity for us to hear God's voice. We have got to have God's voice in our life. In, in a world where so much of our time is taken by so many others' voices, everywhere you go, you're getting yelled at by voices. You turn on the television, you've got news and political commentators and sports commentators and commercials, and they're all yelling at you. You open up your phone and you've got social media, X and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and everybody's yelling at you. It's hard to have a moment where we get quiet, isn't it? Even in a room like this, it felt a little bit awkward just a moment ago to just be quiet for a moment. And yet we must have God's voice in our lives. We must have the voice of his word in our lives. We must have the voice of his Holy Spirit in our lives. But also, can I just tell you a reality of the Christian experience? You're going to have to use your voice. You're going to have to use your voice. I know it's gotten popular to think if I just will be a good example, then surely people will see and know who I am and what I believe and who I follow. You're going to have to use your voice. You're gonna to have to stand up and be counted. You're gonna to have to put voice to what you believe and who it is that you follow. It occurs to me that in the modern day, we, this idea of our voices, it seems like we're having a, a, a reversal of reality. See, in the modern day, we've reversed whose voice belongs where. We deconstruct the word of God when it's the voice of God that ought to deconstruct us. We come into a place like this and we want the voices on stage to bless us in worship while the Lord waits for our voices to bless him. We sit idly waiting for God's voice to call us up to his kingdom of heaven when he's commanded us to use our voices to proclaim his kingdom come here. We've gotta be careful that we don't reverse the role of our voices and his voice. There's a very ancient, you can think of it as a, an early discipleship guide of the church called the Didache. And this was put together about 200 AD. So this is very quickly after the church is born following the resurrection of Christ. And in that early document outlining how the early church was discipled, they discuss the two ways, that there's a way of life and there's a way of death. There's nothing in between. There's a way of life and there's a way of death. And God's word, this word opens up a world. We live in that world and we live in the power and the presence and the purpose of God through Jesus Christ. That is the way of life. But we fall away from that word and we fall into the way of death. Have you noticed that no one accidentally becomes holy? <laughs> when was the last time you accidentally did something right? Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. We don't fall into righteousness. It's only intentional. You're gonna have to use your voice. And the more and more we move through this life, it seems like we wanna make Christianity just a, a, a thought experiment. Something we think about, a, a state of mind even. And yet you are an active participant. Christianity is a verb. You're a messenger. You're a faithful voice. And this isn't your biggest obstacle. This is your biggest opportunity. I know it seems scary. 
I know the cost is high in some places to use your voice faithfully for him, but this is not an obstacle. I promise this is an opportunity because the beginning of our faith is when we say the voice of God expressed in this word knows what is best for me more than I do. And when he's called us to this faithful voice, this faithful life, that's an opportunity, not an obstacle. Here's the second thing about John's call. Look again in verses three through five. This was, the, this was what was spoken of through Isaiah the prophet, a voice calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths. John's clothes were made of camel hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. John is a complete contrast to the people around him. And that's number two. The call of John calls us to be a faithful contrast. Look at everything that's unique about John. What you may have missed is that his baptism itself is totally unique. In times prior to this, there was a baptism. Those who were being converted to Judaism, they would come and be baptized, they'd be washed. But here's how it would look. In the final stages of the conversion, The priest would say, go and wash in that pool, be baptized, and they would go down and they would baptize themselves. They would cleanse themselves. And here comes John, and he's doing something entirely unique. He is doing the baptizing. And it's a picture that we can't do this cleansing on our own. We have to have somebody else, Jesus, to cleanse us from the unrighteousness of sin. Look at his clothing, how unique his clothing is. It's kind of bizarre even. Look at his diet, his Nazarene vow. Listen to his message. He's calling out sin. He's calling people to repentance. Everything about John is contrasting him from the life and the people around him. Larry Hurtado is a scholar that has studied the, uh, the beginnings of Christianity in the Roman Empire. When the church is born after Christ, it's born into a civilization uh, of of Greco-Roman control. And the early church existed in that environment, and then it changed that environment permanently. Larry Hurtado's point is that it completely ended Greco-Roman pagan worship, the early church. And here is Larry Hurtado quoting an early observer of Christianity in Rome, and I want you to just listen to this description and ask yourself if we can say the same about the church today. This observer said they are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country, by language or community. They follow the local customs and dress and meat and other aspects of life, yet they demonstrate a remarkable and admittedly unusual character of their own citizenship. They participate in everything as citizens, but they refuse to worship the traditional deities, disdainfully referring to them as mere objects of wood or stone or bronze. There's there's some style in that. There's some style in that. They marry like everyone else, have children, but they do not expose their offspring. Exposure was a practice where if you didn't want the child or you didn't like the child, you just take them out and leave them in the cold and nature takes its course. They share their food, but not their wives. (laughs) How about that? How would you like somebody standing back and and scratching their head? I I just don't get it. They share their food, but not their wives. That, That seems so silly to us today, but it was because of the faithfulness of these people that We think that that's crazy today. So effective was their contrast. They exceed the demands of laws in their private lives, living by higher standards than earthly laws require. I wonder if we've done any of that lately while driving. Uh Uh-oh. When slandered, insulted, or cursed, they bless in return and offer respect. When put to death, they rejoice as though brought to life. They are dispersed all over the world and yet are not of the world. Rather, 
Catch this now, catch this. They seem very much to the world as like what the soul is to the body. Oh, church, if that could be said of us today. In the places that you go, can it be said that we are like soul to the body, that we bring life, that we bring love, that we bring truth, that we bring grace, that we bring hope, I understand the appeal to just kind of fade into the background. It seems like that's not costly, but it is. To compartmentalize your faith, to maybe even adjust it to your own liking. Let's tone down all the controversial stuff. We don't need any of that. I know that seems like the best way, but it's not. I know it seems like the way without cost, but it is. It's a missed opportunity to be everything that Christ has intended for us to be. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, uh, there seems to be a trend among believers today. Those of us who have experienced amazing grace want to turn it into amazing grace. That we seem to take Christianity, following Christ, and remix it to our liking. We seem to want to take whatever path we want to take and just as long as we proclaim our love for Christ, we can do what we want all of the time. We can believe what we want all of the time. We can just take whatever path we want in this maze and feel that we are still following him, but while you're welcome to do that, you can't be surprised when that path comes to a dead end. There's only one way, one truth, one life, Jesus Christ, his way of life, his command and call, his requirements. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you may know, was the outspoken critic of Nazi Germany, pastor, who went on the offensive against the Nazis in World War II, and he ended up in a concentration camp and was executed not too many days, actually, before the camp was liberated. And Bonhoeffer, observing this same reality in his time, the silence of believers, when there ought to be a contrast with the culture and the prevailing sentiment around them, and he said, some seem to prefer a so-called humble invisibility in the form of total conformity to the world over what some might call a legalistic visibility. Here they would imagine Christ commanded, be sure that your light does not shine. That's not the call of our Savior. The opportunity that God has given us is to live in contrast, not counter a contrasting culture, not a counterculture. And we're not going on battle. We're not beating anybody up. We're not putting anybody down, but we are being a faithful breath of air in contrast. Or to put it simply, if someone's following Christ, they just ought to look different. Don't you agree? They just ought to look different. Contrast. So a, the call of John calls us to be a faithful voice. The call of John calls us to be a faithful contrast. And finally this, the call of John calls us to be faithful servants. Look again at verse six. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by John in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The call of John calls us to be faithful servants, faithful in demonstrating the fruit of repentance, faithful in demonstrating the fruit of one who follows Jesus Christ in repentance. Obedience to the call even 
at a great cost. John is going to go on and, and later, and we're going to talk about this next week and the week following, we'll see the later scenes of his life where he's going to suffer greatly because of the call that is upon him and his obedience to it. But John is faithful through it all. Even in his strongest moments of doubt, he's faithful through it all. And we, like John, even if the cost is high, even if the, the road is rough, even if we, we seemingly face persecution from every angle and become more and more alone in the world, we are called to be faithful servants. Now, for everyone who is a believer, there is a universal call to ministry. Every single person is called to do ministry, and you're doing it in a variety of ways. It's based on the gift that God has given you. It's based upon how he's leading you in obedience to demonstrate the fruit of his work in your life and in your heart. Every single believer, universally, is called to do ministry. Not to have ministry done for them by professionals that we watch do it, but called to do ministry. But there is a very particular call to vocational ministry. This is not a call to go and do ministry, but to lead those who do ministry. There may be some in this room, the Lord has been leading you in a call to vocational ministry for a long time. If that is you, here are some of the signs that he might be working in your heart in that way. You might hear from people, you would make a great pastor, missionary, Bible school teacher, whatever. And you might grimace when you hear that. Believe me, I did for eight years. You might be in a service somewhere and you see a pastor on a platform delivering a message, you see singers on the platform and they're leading in worship and you might think to yourself, I could do that better. You, a lot of you thinking that right now about this message <laughs> and there are plenty of you in here who can. And you know what, that is not, that's not a point of pride that is a gift that God has put in your spirit that is not being stewarded. It's not being used. And there's truth to it. It's a signal. You might fear, if I obey this and I surrender to a call vocationally, I'm going to have to give up all kinds of control. You might fear, I, I, I'm going to have to give away everything that I have and go to a place where I'll have nothing. And none of this is necessarily true, but these are the fears that we come up with. You might say to yourself, well, I could never do that because of X, Y, Z in my past. That surely disqualified me. Or I don't know enough about the Bible. Or I don't live well enough that someone could follow me and I not be a hypocrite. These are all things, but those of you who are in the room that there might be a vocational call on your life, probably you know it. And probably your biggest objection is, I need the Lord to reveal to me what it is. Can I let you in on a secret? Number one, it's not just one thing. It's a lifetime of things ahead of you. So he can't reveal all of it to you at once. It would freak you out. It would scare you. You, you don't want that, trust me but also the bigger reality, you will never know it until you take a step forward because we walk by faith and not by sight. And the very prayer that we're praying is, Lord, I think you might have a call on my life, but cripple my faith from the start. He's not gonna, he's not gonna do that. He's going to exercise your faith to make you into the person that can handle the weight of that which he's about to place on you. John is called in a particular way. You may be too.
in uh, closing in the opening days of World War II, there's a scene that Pierre von Passant writes about. I took French in high school. <laughs> it has never been useful to me other than one flight on Air France and to say French names with a little bit of an accent and hope that you think I'm smart. <laughs> Pierre Passant, in an account of an incident that happened in the beginning days of Nazi Germany, I came across this just the other day and it is an, it's an absolutely arresting account of a contrast that occurred on the streets of Germany really not that long ago. The story goes like this. I'm, I'm gonna read it to you and I apologize that I'm reading it to you, but I want you to catch every detail. In this account, the brown shirts go into a village and they pull out a rabbi, a local rabbi from his synagogue and they bring him out into the streets and they surround him and the whole community comes out and witnesses this encounter. And in the, the recent world events that we've witnessed, the atrocities that we've seen all afresh and anew, when we used to look back and say, how in the world could this have happened 80 years ago? It's, it's not that difficult to see it anymore, is it? It's not that difficult to see how atrocities can just be looked over until it's too late. They bring this priest and they put him in the middle of town and this is what Passant says. They first forced him to remove all of his clothing, including his wedding ring, then bent him over a barrel, beat him numb with a leather strap. Here are some stripes for Abraham. Here are some for Isaac. Here are some for Jacob. And finally, they unfastened him and displayed him. The brown shirts surrounded the rabbi. One walked over with a pair of scissors and cut the left side of Rabbi Warner's hair away. Then they took hold of the rabbi's beard and cut the right side away. All the while, the troopers laughed and slapped their sides. Say something in Hebrew, the SA captain ordered. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. The rabbi slowly pronounced the Hebrew words. But one of the officers interrupted him. Were you not preparing your sermon this morning? Yes, the rabbi said. Well, then preach it here to us. You're never going to see your synagogue again. We've just burned that. Go ahead. Preach the sermon, he cried out. Everybody quiet now. Jacob is going to preach a sermon to us. Jacob took a breath. May I have my hat? The rabbi asked. You can't preach without your hat, the officer demanded. Fine, give him his hat. Someone handed the rabbi his hat and he put it on his head. The sight made the SA men laugh all the more. The man was naked, shivering, half bald on one side, half beardless on the other, with nothing but his hat for cover. He stood emotionless before his tormentors, staring silently at the men who so enjoyed doing evil and reveled in the rabbi's humiliation. And then he spoke. God created men in his image and likeness. That was to be my text. Here stands a rabbi before men created in the image and likeness of God, but yet have lost touch totally with any of it. And here stands a man in the image and likeness of God himself, totally humiliated, but hanging to the threads of his faith. Do you think it occurred to the SA brown shirts that stood in front of that rabbi that when he proclaimed that men were made in the image and likeness of God, that they were too, but that they had totally lost touch, had been totally decayed, polluted, 
my sin. And it occurs to me that 2,000 years before the scene that occurs in early stages of Nazi Germany, there stands another Jewish man that they called rabbi in front of another crowd created in the image of likeness of God that takes joy in beating him, humiliating him, spitting upon him, a crown of thorns on his head, his beard plucked out. But this time he goes all the way up a hill called Calvary to a waiting cross and there the Son of God is crucified by his very own creation made in the image and likeness of God but destroyed by sin so that they could be redeemed from sin. This is the invitation. The whole of human experience has been degraded by sin. The very image of God on humanity has been profaned. When we could be so much more, that's the invitation. We could be so much more than we are. And the, what, what the world needs most is a few Christians to reflect the image and likeness of God to a dim and dying world. Standing in contrast to all that's gone awry. And here's the, don't believe this idea that has crept in. You don't have to be some cool person to do this. You don't have to be some so-called relevant person to do this. You don't have to be some self-righteous person. You don't have to be some fitting in person. All you need to be is a redeemed person person who can show the world what it looks like to live a redeemed life in the image and likeness of God with a Savior who redeems. That's what the world needs most. That's the invitation that John's life calls us to. That's the calling of John that calls us to something more. But you'll never get to be part of that redeemed group until you've received the Son, the Redeemer himself. This Jesus who went to that cross and three days later rose from the dead, taking victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the pollution, victory over everything that has gone wrong and sets us back into a relationship with the God who created us in his image and likeness. How's your soul? How's your soul? What needs to change? What do you need God to do in you and through you? When we look at the life of John the Baptist, the thing that rings through the pages of all history is this. It could be so much more. God has given us an opportunity not just to come and have church week after week, but to live a thrilling life, chasing him, proclaiming him, being used by him to see others come across that bridge to life in him. Would you bow your heads with me? In another just simple moment of silence, would you ask that question again? How is your soul? How is your soul? Just take an honest look. Are you trying to stand in the background? Has Christianity just become a state of mind? A thought experiment? Or are you an active participant, a voice, a contrast, a faithful servant? We're going to have an invitation. The altar is open. Our prayer partners are going to be here. I'll be here as well. Here's what I'd like to invite you to do. There are some in this room the invitation for you is simply this. You need to meet the Redeemer that we've talked about this morning. You're not yet on this path. 
You're not yet a voice, a contrast, a servant, because you haven't yet met the Redeemer. Jesus Christ stands with open arms. All those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the day of salvation. I want to invite you to begin a relationship with him. Second part of the invitation. Many of us in this room, we began that relationship long ago. But if we're honest with ourselves, we have not been following the universal call that's on every one of us to use the gifts, the talents, the convictions, the voice of the Holy Spirit and the Word in our life to serve Him wherever that ministry might lie. And I believe there are some in this room, the Lord has been after you for a long time about a vocational call. You see someone on this platform preaching and you know it ought to be you. You see someone up here leading worship, you know it ought to be you. You watch this Lottie Moon video and see people in nations far, far away proclaiming in some of the deepest, darkest reaches of this earth and you know it ought to be you. I want to invite you to say yes to God today. I know what it's going to cost. I know it's scary. I know it seems like something you can't do and truly it's not. It's not something any of us can do in our own strength, but God will be with you. I'll invite you to this altar where you can pray a prayer of surrender and yes to God, whatever that might be.